Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. It's always appreciated. Um, I'm very grateful. Uh, just a quick reminder that we've got the main speak this Saturday at the Sankara, which is here in Westlands. Um, we'll be hosting founder Richard Britton Long of St. Paul's Property Trust PLC and have a panel discussion. Um, St. Paul's is a UK Fort focused property company invests primarily in UK government and quasi-government occupied properties. They've got a strong track record of investing in this space, long and short lease, AAA rated assets outside of central London. And they consider it a niche opportunity in between traditional institutional buyers and private investors. Long lease assets are known as the platform properties and they also go for short lease assets which are known as opportunistic properties. You can imagine a short lease, uh, the value uh, slides down, but obviously if you can extend it, then you create tremendous value creation around that event. Um, currency hedging portfolio properties held by St. Paul's PLC provides an income stream in hard currency. Um, it's going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, I look forward to it and I hope to see you all there. My speakers are free to attend forum. Uh, we've had wonderful guests and uh, wonderful discussions. And if you want to know what it what it's like, do have a look at the link, which is on YouTube and on Rich Ratlabs. The FOMC is the main game over the next 24 hours. This is ANZ in a note to clients. We retain the view that the next rate hike could come as early as June, and it would be reasonable to expect further increases in the second half of 2016. However, the outlook remains data dependent, they say. My view is that really uh, the Fed should be hiking at this time around. I don't think they are. Um, I think we're going to look at two or three rate hikes into year end. Um, but uh, you know, we're in a difficult situation now because the market might well um, rally strongly and the dollar might sell off in the event of a no change decision. But ultimately, Let's keep an eye on things and see where we go from here. Home thoughts, this is what sunrise looks like at the most beautiful beach in the world, Diani Beach, Kenya. And indeed, it's a wonderful beach, and if you haven't been there, you should. And then I like this photograph, stunning sunrise in Nairobi, um, and that was uh, a beautiful photograph as well. Touching on some Arthur Kessler, who wrote the very well-known book, Darkness of the Moon, the principal mark of genius is not perfection, but originality, the opening of new frontiers. And then some of the greatest discoveries consist mainly in the clearing away of psychological roadblocks which obstruct the approach to reality, which is why post factum they appear so obvious. I like this photograph which has gone around the world. It's Adenar Duro's stunning nighttime photograph of Monches de la Pacana. And it was taken in such strong wind that he had to pile rocks on the base of his tripod to stop it from shaking. The monolith pictured is the most emblematic of the desert's gigantic rock formations, a perfect combination of altitude. Dry air and a lack of it. light pollution means the Atacama. It's one of the best stargazing locations on Earth. Cloudless skies, April through September, is a peak period to appreciate the stars, as well as Jupiter and Saturn. You won't even need a telescope to see the breathtaking light show above. Darker skies are best, so avoid visiting during a full moon. I like this photograph that Robert Mablethorpe took of Andy Warhol in 1986. Political reflections. A king in his castle, how Donald Trump lives from his longtime butler. This is in the New York Times. Everything seemed to sparkle at the Mar-a-Lago estate here on a recent afternoon. The sun glinted off the pool black secret service SUVs in the circular driveway. Palm trees rustled in a warm breeze, croquet balls clicked and a security guard stood at the entrance to Donald J. Trump's 
private living quarters. You can always tell when the king is here, Mr. Trump's longtime butler here, Anthony Senegal, said of the master of the House and the Republican presidential candidate. He understands Mr. Trump's sleeping patterns and how he likes his steak. It would rock on the plate, it was so well done. And how Mr. Trump insists, despite the hair salon on the premises, on doing his own hair. Mr. Senecal knows how to stroke his ego and lift his spirits like the time years ago he received an urgent warning from Mr. Trump's soon-to-land plane that the mogul was in a sour mood. Mr. Senecal quickly hired a bugler to play hail to the chief as Mr. Trump stepped out of his limousine to enter Mara Lager. Mr. Trump is abundantly proud of his ability to drive a golf ball, once asking rhetorically during a news conference, do I hit it long? Is Trump strong? Mr. Senegal suggested that Mr. Trump was perhaps not quite as strong as he imagined. Remembering times they would hit balls together from the Mar-a-Lago property into the intracoastal waterway. Tony, how far is that? Mr. Trump would ask like 275 yards. Mr. Senegal would respond that he said the actual distance <coughs> was 225 yards. Trump has knocked Rubio out of the Republican race and essentially looks like a head-to-head -head between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. I don't want to remind you, but you know, I remember what uh, Lamine told me so that you know, one of the greatest risks is that there is an attack with two weeks to go to the election and Trump points out and says, look, that's what I was telling you, and he gets in on the landslide. He came, he saw, he withdrew from Syria. This is foreign policy. Putin is now exiting Syria as quietly as he entered it. And they're saying a second unofficial reason for Putin's foray into Syria was the opportunity to demonstrate Russia's restored military might. I call this showboating actually a couple of times. In fact, one of the main goals of a mission was to test new weaponry under combat conditions, a source in the Russian general staff told the Commerçant newspaper Tuesday. Caliber cruise missiles launched from warships in the Caspian Sea were fired at targets almost 1,000 miles away in Syria on October the 7th, Putin's birthday. Tactical purpose was dubious. Cruise missiles are typically used to penetrate air defences that the Syrian rebels could only dream of getting their hands on. Nevertheless, the use of the missiles did make US military planners perk up. Sorties flown by long-range strategic bombers based in Russia had a similar effect. It's unclear what exactly he's up to. I doubt he's withdrawn completely and left Assad to, uh, 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 to his own devices. I suspect uh, he's done a deal with, with uh, Saudi Arabia and Turkey and says, I'll take a step back, but you two have got to take a step back. Markets in March may have come in like a lamb, but the lion may be lurking. This is a chart showing you volatility versus the S&P 500. Let's move on to the currency markets. Euro 110.91, dollar index 96.75, Japanese yen 113.50. I'll come to why that's softening in a minute. Swissy 0.9878, the pound, which when I walked in was at 141.32, is it now at 114.96. Aussie, uh, let's take a look at what that's doing, 0.7455, India rupee 67.435, South Korean 111.9245. The real, I think it's going back over fours at 376.64. Egyptian pound 8.952, Iran crumbled yesterday, last trading 15.94. Dollar index, I'll put up a one month chart. Obviously, as I wrote in the weekend, the markets will pivot on the Fed decision this week. Yen weakens versus the dollar, as Kuroda says, minus 0.5% rate is theoretically possible for Japan. Sterling, I'll put up a three month chart, we're on the down move again. Campari's deal comes with Chaser, getting a villa on the French Riviera, Davide Campari Milano Spa 
is getting more than a popular liqueur brand with its acquisition of Grand Marnier Group. Italian distiller also takes ownership of a historic villa in a French coastal town that's reputed to have the most expensive residential real estate in the world. Put up a photograph of that Villa des Cedres in Saint Jean, Cap Ferras. Oh, sorry, I struggled with my French. Hannah will tell me off. Gold is now trading at 1234.65. I'll put up a six month chart. Needs to regain 1250. Um, otherwise, we're in a consolidating down move. Crude oil came back down $38.62 last. This is uh, in New York. Uh, the front contracts at 38.20. I think there's a lot of sellers and hedges above 40. Emerging markets, real. Let me put up a one month chart. Beginning to sell off again, 376. I think it goes back over four. Lots of political risk in Brazil. Demonstrators have been protesting against Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff. Uh, this photograph is from the Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro. Let's move on to Africa. Al Qaeda Africa affiliate reasserts threat with Ivory Coast tank. We are seeing Akim able to carry out attacks even in countries in West Africa that have not been at the forefront of terrorist activity. It's been three years since terrorist groups in Mali emerged. This is General Zagre, Burkina Faso's army's chief of staff. Since then, security in the Sahel and in Libya had badly deteriorated. He said that the menace of terrorism uh, in West Africa has only grown. Interesting piece by International Crisis Group talking about exploiting disorder, Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. Past quarter century seen waves of jihadist violence, first in the early 90s when volunteers from the anti-Soviet jihad in Afghanistan joined insurrections elsewhere. A second pioneered by Al-Qaeda culminating in the 9-11 attacks, a third sparked by the US invasion of Iraq, today's fourth wave is the most perilous yet. I think they're right. Tough times for democracy in Zambia. This is Deutsche Welle. Edgar Lungu seems anxious. According to several observers, he's no longer able to hide it. Elections are set for August 11, 2016. He previously won by a very small margin. The economy has not been good. That might well tip him over the edge. Angola facing economic and political pressures has cut spending under its 2016 budget by 20%. This is a, re a report in the Wall Street Journal. So, um, hot, uh, and of course, we've also learned that Dos Santos is ready to step down in 2018. But nevertheless, they remain under significant pressure, as I previously said. The assurances that he was still in the country given to the High Court at the commencement and during the course of argument were false. This is the Supreme Court in South Africa. It was disgraceful conduct. SCA ruled on Tuesday that the failure to arrest Bashir was unlawful and dismissed the government's appeal. The South African All Share is uh, uh, close to a 2016 high, up 3.08% this year, but the currency crashed 3.4% to breach the 16 level for the first time since February 29. And this is all about Gordon's dispute with the special unit known as the Hawks. Um, government is attempting to ward off a credit rate and downgrade to junk. Uh, markets are very jittery. If it results in the removal of the finance minister, it speaks to even further institutional erosion in South Africa. That's what international investors are absolutely terrified about. It seems that the political atmosphere is increasingly toxic at a time when Gordon is making attempts to restore confidence among foreign investors after it was completely shattered by the finance ministry debacle in December. 14th of March, as at Barclays, may be the first of many South African exits. El Mutual is now the second. Barclays CEO Staley says he's cut 6,000 jobs in his first 100 days. We've now reduced the headcount by well north of 6,000 people, so double what was done in the last four years in the first four months, he says. Go back to my piece on the 14th of December, when I was writing about the acrimonious exit of Nene. He 
hitting Africa's economy. And I said, as we all know, speed is the essence of the global markets today. And I say this respectfully, the markets are not interested in Zuma's explanations. They're seeing a South African president who has gone rogue. Put up his photograph again. Look at the six month chart dollar rand. I think it's going to print 20 this year. Put up another photograph of President Zuma by Valdo Svigas of Bloomberg. The Egyptian EGX 30 is now plus 1.9% for the year. It's up 16.745% in March and now in a bull market. The Nigerian all share is down 10.11% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index down 2.05% year to date. Congo opposition is to hold protest over jailing of youth activists. This is a group of protesters called Lucha, pioneering something new in terms of activism in the Congo. They are ready to confront the government and go to prison. They're using it as a tactic. The fact that the government sees Lucha as such a threat is indication of their success. Tanzania's Magafuli is pushing for a quick start to Uganda's oil pipeline as Kenya tries to salvage the deal. Total's vice president for East Africa assured President John Magafuli that the company will begin construction of the crude oil pipeline project from Uganda to the Tanga port as quickly as possible because there is money for the project. And that's a big loss to Kenya, I'm afraid. The Economist Hidden Menace, Lake Kivu has likely exploded before it may do so again. World Economic Forum, South Sudan, one of the most horrendous human rights situations in the world since the UN. Look at what's happened. IMF Executive Board has approved new arrangements for Kenya totaling $1.5 billion. This is a press release from March the 14th. Uh, double the previous size. Mr. Min Zhu, Deputy Managing Director and Acting Chair, said Kenya's recent growth performance remains robust. Outlook is positive despite positive policy steps undertaken on, under the current fund supported program. The economy remains vulnerable to shocks, reflecting less favorable global financial market conditions, as well as continued security threats and potential extreme weather events. In this context, the new precautionary arrangements would provide a policy anchor for continued macroeconomic and institutional reform and would help mitigate the impact of potential exogenous shocks that were to materialize. Quite a statement of support from the IMF uh, for Henry Rotich, and uh, I'll put up a photograph that I took yesterday discussing a number of things. Ken Schilling has been very stable. Have a look at this. Uh, chart from business, I call it the Teflon shilling, trading at 101.50, that thereabouts. The CBK is set to implement an interest rate corridor setting the up and lower limits, aligning the interbank rates with the central bank rate. This is something that the IMF has disclosed. The Nairobi all shares minus 0.59% year to date. NSE 20 minus 2.96% year to date. Interesting piece in foreign policy, Kenya's vicious war against its youth. One day in 2014, university students Felix Nyangena and Dennis Magomer, 21 and 22 years old respectively, were walking from the Globe Cinema roundabout, which is not far, and which I go around to get to the city more quickly. In Nairobi Central Business District, the nearby offices of the Higher Education Loans Board, a government agency that oversees financial disbursements to students, the Globe Cinema Roundabout is one of Kenya's capital's busiest bus terminals. And during the day, it can be among the most densely populated parts of the city. There, in the gentle light of the still rising sun, Yangena and Magomero were gunned down by two plainclothes police officers attached to the city's anti mugging unit. Yangena did not die immediately, so the officer stood over his body and fired two twice more, killing the young man in broad daylight. The officer then calmly wiped his fingerprints off the gun, planted it on the young man's body, and made a call, presumably to report a robbery. We know all of this because unlike many other extrajudicial killings by police and security officials in Kenya, Yangena and Magomera's murders were captured on video crisp, high-quality footage of the crime taken, of a, taken on a witness's mobile phone as the centerpiece of a recent documentary 
by noted Kenyan journalist Mohamed Ali on the epidemic of extrajudicial killings and forced disappearances by security services. And perhaps as a result of both the video and the documentary, Kenya's public prosecutors announced that for the first time in recent memory, his office will charge a police officer for the unlawful killing of a civilian. Have a look at Mohamed Ali's documentary for Al Jazeera, People of Power. That link is at the bottom of the bridge wrap up. Um, it's something that I think we've got to do something about because it can't go on like this. Once again, thank you for stopping by.